All right, here in section 2.3, we're going to uh, continue studying limits. And here we're going to focus on uh, some techniques for computing limits. So at this time, uh, we've used tables to numerically determine limits. And we've also looked at graphs to graphically determine limits. Uh, but to be brutally honest, tables and graphs are, are very weak. And they're also very inefficient. They take time. Um, not only do they take a lot of time, very time consuming, but when I say they're weak, um, I mean they're not really valid. They're just giving us a really good idea, but we need a little bit more mathematical oomph to what we're doing. So we need a better, more efficient, more mathematically sound method for determining limits. And that's what this section is all about. In this section, we're going to learn some theorems to help us in determining limits. So here's our first theorem. Uh, in this theorem, A and B uh, are representing real numbers, and N is uh, a positive integer. So part one, the limit as X approaches A of B equals B. In English, number one is saying that the limit of a constant is that constant. It doesn't matter what you're approaching. As long as it's just a constant, the limit of a constant is that constant. You know, number two says the limit as X approaches A of X. Well, that's just A. And in three, the limit as X approaches A of X to the N. Well, that's just equal to A to the N. So let's look at a quick example to practice uh, uh, this theorem. So in this example, we're going to determine the following limits. A is the limit as x approaches negative 1, a 5. B, the limit as x approaches 3 of x. And C is the limit as x approaches 3 of x cubed. So get this example written down because I'm going to head off to the chalkboard to work through it. All right, folks, we're getting started here on a more efficient way to find limits, a more mathematically sound way to find limits. And we just saw a theorem, and um, this example is going to be utilizing that theorem. So here we're going to find uh, the following limits. And part A, the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 5. 5 is a constant. The limit of a constant is that constant. So for A, the limit is 5. It doesn't matter what x is approaching. No matter what number is here, this is the constant. The limit would be 5. And you'd probably like to see about 8 of these on your first test. I mean, you won't, but it's OK to say you'd like to see them. Uh, just remember, limit of a constant is a constant. Part b, the limit as x approaches 3 of x. Well, that's just simply 3. Then in part C, the limit as x approaches 3 of 3 cubed. Well, the limit as x approaches 3 of 3 cubed, according to that theorem, it's 3 cubed. Limit as x approaches 3 of x cubed. Theorem says it's 3 cubed, 27. So three very friendly limits to get us started here in the section where we're going to really learn the real deal on how to compute limits. So let's head back to the slides to see uh, what is next. All right, that was a very friendly example. You're probably hoping you see a bunch of those on your first test. I mean, you won't, but you can hope you do. Uh, continuing on, let's look at uh, this big theorem. It's called limit laws. So these are a lot of laws of limits. So in this theorem, A and B are real numbers. Uh, M is uh, greater than zero and n is greater than zero, and both m and n represent uh, integers. f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches a of f of x and the limit as x approaches a of g of x exist. So the first one, which I would call, if I had to give it a name, I would call it the sum slash difference um, law. It says the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus or minus g of x equals the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus or minus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. And this is true 
you know, no matter how many functions that you have in there that are being added or subtracted, you know, we just list two, F and G. The second limit law is the limit as X approaches A of B times F of X. Remember, B is a constant. So the limit as X approaches A of B times F of X is equal to B times the limit as X approaches A of F of X. This is almost like a, if I had to give it a name, I might call it the constant multiple law. It's saying that you can take that constant B and pass it through or pass it out in front of the whole limit process. Limit law number three says the limit as X approaches A of f of x times g of x. Well, that's equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x times the limit as x approaches a of g of x. So if I had to give this a name, I would call it the product rule. And, you know, in English it says, you know, the left side of that equation says the limit of a product equals, and then the right side would be the product of the limits. So the limit of a product equals the product of the limits. Uh, no surprise, number four would be um, kind of like a quotient rule uh, for limits. It says the limit as X approaches A of F of X over G of X equals the limit as X approaches A of F of X over the limit as X approaches A of G of X. And this is true provided, of course, the limit as X approaches A of G of X does not equal zero. Remember, we do not divide by zero. We do not do that in Ohio. They may do it in Michigan, but not in Ohio. So if I had to, if I had to give English to this one, it would say the limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of limits. Uh, number five, I guess if I had to give it a name, it's kind of like a power rule um, that it says the limit as X approaches A of F of X, and that's raised to the N power. Well, that's equal to doing the limit as X approaches A of F of X and raising that to the N power. Uh, pretty straightforward rule. And then finally, number six is if we had a rational, uh, if we have a rational exponent. It says the limit as X approaches A of F of X to the N over M equals the limit as X approaches A of F of X to the N over M. And this rule is also true uh, provided the F of X is uh, greater than or equal to zero for X values close to A if M is even and N over M is in reduced form. So I bet now we're going to look at an example to just kind of practice uh, some of these limit laws. So here we're going to determine the indicated limits. And, um, you know, I'm giving you that the limit as X approaches one of some function F of X equals eight. The limit as X approaches one of some function G of X is three. And the limit as X approaches one of some function H of X equals two. In part A, let's determine the limit as X approaches one of F of X over H of X. In part B, let's determine the limit as H approaches one of F of X times G of X. And in part C, let's find the limit as X approaches one of the quantity three times G of X times H of X plus F of X. So get this written down. Get it in your notes because I'm heading off to the chalkboard to work through it. All right, this example, we're going to practice some of those limit theorems we just saw. And here uh, you are given that the limit as X approaches one of F of X equals eight. The limit as X approaches one of G of X equals three. The limit as X approaches one of H of X equals two. And we don't know what functions F, G and H are, it's irrelevant. And we're going to determine in part A, the limit is X approaches one, F of X over H of X. So I have the limit of a quotient. So we can rewrite that as the quotient of limits. All 
Now let's see, we were given the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 8. So that's 8 over, and the limit as x approaches 1 of h of x is 2. So for part a, we get the limit is 4. Part b, it's the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x times g of x. So it's a limit of a product. Well, I can rewrite the limit of that product as the product of the limits. So I can rewrite it as the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x times the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. And the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, well, that's 8. The limit as x approaches 1 of g of x, that's 3. So for part B, we get the limit is 24. All right, now in part C, it's the limit as x approaches 1 of the quantity 3 times g of x times h of x plus f of x. So the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this uh, uh, limit of a sum as a sum of two limits. So I'm going to rewrite it as the limit as x approaches 1, 3 g of x, h of x, plus the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. Now we have a constant of times a function times a function. So remember that uh, one I think I said you could call it the constant multiple rule of uh, limits. I could take the constant and I could pass it out or I can move it out in front of the limit statement. So let's write that as 3 times the limit as x approaches 1, g of x, h of x. And we still have this plus limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. And then I could say, well, the limit of this product, I can rewrite it as the product of limits. And once I do that, there's really nothing more I could do. So it's kind of like a Nike problem. We just do it. We know the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is 3. The limit as x approaches 1 of h of x is 2. And the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 8. So we have 3 times 3 times 2 plus 8. See, that's uh, 18 plus 8, 26. So for part C that limit is 26. So just to give you a little bit of practice with these limit theorems and how to utilize them, um, I'd like you to try here in section 2.3, uh, exercise number 10. So go to the, the section 2.3 exercises, do number 10. Pause the video, do number 10, and once you're done doing it, uh, restart the video. I'll be here at the chalkboard working through it. So in exercise number 10, you were given the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 8, limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is 3, and the limit as x approaches 1 of h of x is 2. And in 10, you're asked to find the limit as x approaches 1 of the product f of x times h of x. So it's a limit of a product. We can rewrite it as the product of limits and we know the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x is 8. The limit as x approaches 1 of h of x is 2. So for number 10, we get the limit as 16. So hopefully you got that. It's not too bad, but um, let's head back to the slides and see what is next. All right, hopefully you found this example wasn't too bad using the, um, you know, limit laws and you were able to, you know, do number 10, saw that it was a fr pretty friendly um, homework problem. There's one more example I'd like to do before we leave this screen, and it's determine the following limit. The limit as x approaches 3 of the quantity 2x cubed plus 7. So get it written down. I'm heading back to the chalkboard to uh, determine this limit. All right, here's another example. Determine 
the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x cubed plus 7. So using these limit theorems, these limit laws that you know, we have been using in the last few examples, I can rewrite the limit of a sum. I can rewrite it as the sum of limits. So let me rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x cubed plus the limit as x approaches 3 of 7. Okay, and then this is a, a constant times a function. So remember, I can take the constant and move it out front of the limit process to get 2 times the limit as x approaches 3 of x cubed plus the limit as x approaches 3 of 7. And, uh, well, now I can evaluate, uh, you know, limit as x approaches 3 of x cubed. Well, that's a 3 cubed. And then uh, limit as x approaches 3 of a constant is that constant. See, 3 cubed is 27. 2 times 27 is 54. 54 plus 7, 61. So that limit is 61. Before we head back to the slides, I'd like to point out uh, a quick observation. Notice if we had just started off by immediately substituting 3 in for the x. we would get, well, 3 cubes, 27, 2 times 27 is 54, 54 plus 7 is 61. We would have immediately determined the limit. There might be something to this, so let's head back to the slides and see what is next. All right, folks, in that last example we did, um, you know, I kind of mentioned and illustrated that if we had simply substituted 3 in for the independent variable x in that function immediately, we could have determined the limit. And that's because the function we were looking at was a polynomial function. And polynomial functions are very friendly functions and it gives rise to the following theorem. If P and Q, so in this theorem, if P and Q are both polynomial functions and A is a constant, then the limit as x approaches a of p of x is simply equal to p of a. Now think about what that's saying. It's saying if you have a polynomial function, the limit as x approaches a of the polynomial function is just bound by evaluating the polynomial function at a. It's saying just substitute a in for the x's and do it. Part two of this theorem says the limit as x approaches a of p of x over q of x. So that would be a rational function. It's equal to p of a over q of a, provided, of course, q of a does not equal zero. Again, this is saying just do a direct substitution and see what happens. So let me make the following note. That what I'm talking about, this direct substitution, it is valid. It will work for all polynomial functions, and it will work for rational functions as long as the denominator is not equal to zero. Uh, so, you know, the, this is the first time you're going to hear me say the following. When you're asked to determine a limit, try substitution first. Just try direct substitution. See if it works. So let's look at the following example. Let's determine the following limits. Part A, the limit as x approaches 1 of 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4. Part B, it's the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1 over x minus 4. And part C, it's the limit as x approaches 3 of the square root x plus 1 over x minus 4. So get this written down in your notes because you know uh, I'm going to head off to the chalkboard and work through it. All right, hey, now we're going to find the uh, following limits. Uh, things are getting a little easier, I think, on finding limits. Uh, it's a lot better than having to make tables or look at graphs or do both tables and graphs. And what we're learning now, it's just more mathematically sound and precise, and it's quicker, more efficient. So let's look at the first one here, part A. 
The limit as x approaches 1 of 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4. When asked to find a limit, going forward, when asked to find the limit, the first thing I want you to try is direct substitution. See if it works. So we just directly substitute 1 for the x's. And let's see, we get uh, 3 minus 2 plus 4. It worked. The limit is 5. Pretty friendly. We expected it would work because that's a polynomial function. Part B, the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 1 over x minus 4. The first thing we try is direct substitution. See if it works. So substitute 2 for the x. And we get uh, 2 plus 1 is 3 over 2 minus 4, which is negative 2. So a better way to write that is just negative 3 halves. It worked. Part C, the limit as x approaches 3 of the square root x plus 1 over x minus 4. The first thing you try, direct substitution. See if it works. So we substitute 3 for the x. See, we get the square root of 4 over negative 1. Well, square root of 4 is 2. 2 over negative 1 is negative 2. So it worked. Notice how I keep saying, so it worked. I'm, I'm sure we're going to encounter here real soon when direct substitution doesn't work. But before we get to that, I want you to practice a couple of these uh, just using direct substitution. So in the exercises, go to the, the section 2-3 exercises. I'd like you to try number 24 and number 30. So pause the video, do numbers 24 and numbers, numbers 24 and 30. After you've done those, restart the video. I'll be here at the board working through them. All right, let's see how you did on these. Um, so number 24, the limit is t approaches negative 2 of uh, t squared plus 5t plus 7. So I'll try direct substitution. And so I substitute negative 2 for the t's. See, negative 2 squared is 4. Uh, that's a negative 10. That's a 7. So 4 plus negative 10 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 7, 1. So hopefully you got the limit uh, for number 24 to be 1. Number 30, I'm going to try direct substitution. So I have the limit as h approaches 0. 3 over the square root of 16 plus 3 times 0 plus 4. So that's the limit as h approaches 0 of 3 over the square root of 16 plus 4. See, we know the square root of 16 is 4. Oops. Don't need that limit statement. Square root of 16 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8. So the limit for number 30 is 3 8. So things are looking kind of fun and friendly. Direct substitution, it, it's working. Uh, but let's head back to the slides and see what is next. Maybe we'll do some trig functions. Who knows? All right, folks. So, uh, you know, we saw in that last example, for each one of them, direct substitution worked. Um, you know, I asked you to work through 24 and 30, and you should have seen direct substitution worked. So continuing with this idea of direct substitution, here's a fact for you. Uh, limits for all trigonometric functions can be found using direct substitution as long as we are in the domain of the given trigonometric function. So let's practice this. Let's determine the following limits. Part A, it's the uh, limit as x approaches 2 pi over 3 cosine x. Part B, it's the limit as x approaches 2 pi over 3 of sine x. So um, you know the drill. Write this example down. Get it in your notes because I'm heading off to the chalkboard to work through it. All right. Hey, here we are in this example. We're going to find some limits. And here are some trig functions. 
So it's not too bad. Let's see if direct substitution works. The limit as x approaches 2 pi over 3 of cosine x. So we substitute in 2 pi over 3 for the x. And this is just a basic trig question. It's just something basic off the unit circle. What's the value of cosine of 2 pi over 3? And we know from the unit circle, that's negative 1 half. So that one wasn't too bad. Part B, what's the limit as x approaches 2 pi over 3 of sine x? Again, we tried direct substitution. So we put 2 pi over 3 in for the x. And again, this comes back to the basics of the unit circle. What's the sine of 2 pi over 3? Well, that's square root 3 over 2. So those were not bad at all. And you know what? Try this one and the section 2-3 exercises. Uh, so pause the video, go to the 2-3 exercises, do number 59, then restart the video and I'll be here at the chalkboard working through it. All right, number 59, you're asked to find the limit as x approaches 0 of x times cosine x. So we know the drill by now. Start off by trying direct substitution. And direct substitution will gives us 0 times cosine of 0. We know from the unit circle that cosine of 0 is 1, and 0 times 1 is 0. That's it for 59. The limit is 0. So, so far, so good. Direct substitution has worked every single time. That's about to change. So let's head back to the slides and see uh, what, what do we do in that situation. All right. So, you know, hopefully that last example showed you direct substitution works for trig functions as long as we're in the domain. Um, and, you know, hopefully you got number 59 and you're hopefully saying, hey, this direct substitution is, uh, is pretty cool. It makes finding limits pretty easy. Well, direct substitution isn't always going to work. In fact, most of the time, direct substitution uh, will end up failing. So let's look at an ironclad technique for finding limits, or what I would call a strategy. The first thing you should do is try direct substitution. It might work. So do that first. If direct substitution fails, that is, if the limit as x approaches a of f of x can't be determined, you know, say it gives an indeterminate form, try to find a function g that agrees with function f for all values of x other than x equals a. Then try substitution. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. First is uh, what I have in bold, uh, the phrase indeterminate form. So here's what's going to happen. Here's, what, here's one example of an indeterminate form that um, we're going to see right now. You try direct substitution and you end up, direct substitution gives you 0 over 0. 0 over 0 is an indeterminate form. Direct substitution will have failed. Okay, it also says try to find a function g that's identical to function f for all values of x other than, you know, what we're approaching. So other than x equals a. Okay, now we're going to strategically find this mysterious function g that's mentioned here, and we're going to use algebra to do it. We're going to employ some algebra magic. It's not going to be that bad. And then I have as a strategy number three, uh, as a last resort, use tables and graphs. Um, I don't know how often that's going to appear, that last resort. So let's practice this idea, this strategy. Let's find the following limits. Uh, in A, the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. In B, it's the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x minus 1. And in part C, it's the limit as x approaches 4 of square root x minus 2 over x minus 4. 
So you know the drill, write this down, get it in your notes. I'm heading off to the chalkboard uh, to work through this. All right, here on uh, this example, three parts, uh, determine the limit in each part. So we, we have the same process, folks. We start off by doing direct substitution, but notice in A, when we're finding the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9 over x over 3, then when we substitute, that gives us, well, you put 3 in here for x, the numerator is 0, put 3 in for x, the denominator is 0. So substitution gives us 0 over 0. Remember, that's called an indeterminate form. We don't know what that is. So when you do this, when you try direct substitution and you get 0 over 0, direct substitution has failed. No biggie. You know, we, we are going to do some algebra magic to help us out here. So the algebra magic for this one, factor the numerator. That's a difference of two squares. So it factors to x minus 3 times x plus 3. And then once you factor, you can cancel out the x minus 3's to leave you with just an x plus 3. So in the guidelines I gave, there were like three steps there on uh, techniques or a strategy for finding limits. We tried direct substitution. It failed. So step one, it failed. We're on to step two. Direct substitution failed. And in there I said, you know, you try to find another function g that agrees with function f at all values except the, the value of x that you're approaching. That's what this is talking about. We found a function g at x plus 3. This function is identical to the function x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. For all values of x, those are identical functions except for one value of x. And that one value of x is x equals 3. Not in the domain here, but it is here, which means we can substitute and we get the limit to be 6. So, in fact, if, if you were to look at this function, if you were to look at a graph of this function, that graph would have a hole in it at an x value of 3. Then if you graphed this function on top of it, on the same uh, x-y coordinate system, the graph of this function would be identical to that, except it would fill in that hole. That's it. So, before we go to part B, quick recap. Try direct substitution. When you get the indeterminate form 0 over 0, you need to employ some algebra magic, and then substitute and get the limit. So let's look at part B. The limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x minus 1. So again, we start off with the same first step. And substitution gives us 0 over 0. So we have the indeterminate form 0 over 0. That means we need to do a little bit more work. We need to do a little algebra magic. The numerator factors to x minus 1 times x minus 3. And once we factor, we can cancel out the x minus 1's. And now substitute. So you substitute the 1 in for x, you get the limit to be negative 2. Part C, find that limit. Do substitution. Substitution gives us, when well you put 4 in for the x's, you get 0 over 0. Now there are two routes of algebra magic we could do next. The first one that you may remember doing something like this back in algebra is to multiply by the, 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 con, like the conjugate. So you would multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of x plus 2. So if you, you could multiply the numerator and denominator by square root x plus 2. The other route is to factor. Factor the denominator. And if you're looking at that, you're saying, well, how can you factor the denominator? It's just an x minus 4. 
it really is the difference of two squares. It factors to the square root of x minus 2 times the square root of x plus 2. So x minus 4 does factor to that. If you don't believe it, foil it out and you'll see you get x minus 4. But once you factor, you can cancel the square root x minus 2's. That leaves you with the limit as x approaches 4 of 1 over the square root of x plus 2. Substitute in the 4 and you get the limit to be 1 over square root 4 plus 2, which is 1 fourth. All right, I have three of them here I want you to practice. So in section 2.3, I would like you to try 34, 40, and 52. So pause the video, do those three problems, restart the video, and I'll be here at the chalkboard. We'll work through them, and hopefully you have the correct answers. All right, folks, number 34, you're asked to find the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 2x minus 3 all over x minus 3. So if you do try direct substitution, as you should, that should be your first step, you'll get the indeterminate form 0 over 0. So you need to do a little algebra. So here, uh, let's see, I think that numerator factors to x minus 3 times x plus 1. So you can then, uh, once you factor the numerator, you can cancel out the x minus 3's. And then now you can directly substitute to get the limit is 4. So hopefully you got that. That one wasn't too bad. Okay, 40, if you do direct substitution, substitute 0 for the h. You get 1 fifth minus 1 fifth, which is 0 over zero. So you have indeterminate form, zero over zero. So now here, well, you know, we got to do some algebra. So maybe you decided up here uh, in the numerator of this complex fraction to get a common denominator and rewrite it as, you know, one fraction with a common denominator. I'm actually going to use the common denominator a little differently. I mean, look at the numerator here. The numerator, 1 over 5 plus h minus 1 fifth. The common denominator for the numerator would be 5 times 5 plus h. So I'm going to take this ugly looking complex fraction and I'm going to multiply it by 5 times 5 plus h over 5 times 5 plus h. Notice I'm just taking this complex fraction and I'm just multiplying it by a version of 1. I mean, that is just 1. But here's a neat thing that happens. In the, in the numerator, well, I'm going to have to distribute. So when 5 times 5 plus h gets distributed to 1 over 5 plus h, the 5 plus h's would cancel out which leaves me with a 5. When the 5 times 5 plus h gets distributed to the 1 fifth, the 5's cancel out, which just leaves me with a 5 plus h. And then the denominator, well, I multiply those together and I get a 5h times a 5 plus h. So it's kind of cool. I got rid of the ugliness of a complex fraction and I just have a, well, a regular looking fraction. So continuing, cleaning stuff up here. 5 minus 5 plus h. Well, if I distribute the negative 1, combine like terms, we know 5 minus 5 is 0. So I have negative h over 5h times 5 plus h. I can then cancel out the h's. And that leaves me with a negative 1 over 5 times 5 plus h. 
Now I can substitute, I get negative 1 over 5 times 5 plus 0. That's a negative 1 over 25. Not too bad. So now on number 52, if I substitute, I end up with 0 over 0. I mean, I mean it is what it is. Got to do some algebra. So here's where I would start 52. I would start by, in the second fraction, I would, uh, I would factor the denominator. Okay, now I'm going to get a common denominator so I can write this as just one fraction. So it looks like the uh, uh, LCD is x times x minus 2. So I'd have to write this fraction uh, as x over x times x minus 2. And then I have a minus 2 times x times x minus 2. So once I have a common denominator, I'll go ahead and uh, write it as just one fraction. That's the whole point of getting a common denominator. And then once I do that, I see the, uh, I see the x minus 2s. Well, they cancel out. So I'm just left with a 1 over, a 1 over x. Substitute in the 2. I get the limit to be 1 half. So hopefully you got those three. Let's head back to the slides and see uh, what we're about to talk of, We're going to talk about when we go back to the slides. It's a really important theorem that's going to be with you for the entire calculus sequence. It just keeps popping up throughout all of calculus. So let's go see what this theorem is. All right, folks, that last example, um, you know, those are typical limit problems that, um, that we did. Uh, for each one of them, we tried direct substitution and it gave us the indeterminate form zero over zero. And then, you know, I stress that when you get that indeterminate form zero over zero, that should be a signal to you that you need to do some algebra magic. And uh, for almost all of them we did there, we saw the algebra magic was factoring. Uh, then I asked you to do three uh, problems from the exercise set. And hopefully you were getting dialed in and you're starting to see, um, you know, how to find limits, how to utilize the strategy that uh, uh, I provided. Our next theorem, and it's the final theorem here in uh, uh, section 2.3. This is a very important theorem. It's a biggie. This is a theorem that is just going to keep popping up throughout the calculus sequence. Uh, it, it is that important. It is utilized so often throughout calculus. You know, when we look at the theorem, we're going to say on the surface, it seems very straightforward uh, because, it, well, actually it is pretty straightforward. But I don't want the, uh, the straightforwardness or how it seems very easy. I don't want that to diminish how powerful this theorem is. So to give some insight into this theorem, uh, let's look at this graph over here to the right. Now notice in this graph, if we were to make a, an interval around uh, x equals a, so if we make an open interval that's containing a, doesn't it look like the graph of function g is, uh, quote, trapped between the graphs of f and h? I mean, it looks to me like the graph of function g is trapped between f and h. In fact, we can, we can write down or we can visually see that this compound inequality is true for an open interval around uh, x equals a. Uh, f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x. So function g is trapped between f and h. Now, since function g is trapped between functions f and h, it seems reasonable that if we know the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l, and we know the limit as x approaches a 
of h of x equals l, then what's trapped between functions f and h, which is function g, it should have the exact same limit. In other words, we should have the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals l. And that is exactly what this theorem called the squeeze theorem states. So let's formally write down the squeeze theorem. I got the, the graph back one more time so we can look at it as we're uh, writing down the squeeze theorem. So here's your squeeze theorem. It says if f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x for all values of x and some open interval containing a. And if limit as x approaches a of f of x is l and the limit as x approaches a of h of x is l, then our conclusion is the limit as x approaches a of g of x is also l. That's the squeeze theorem. And we're going to do a quick example to practice using the squeeze theorem. So we're going to use the squeeze theorem to verify that the limit as x approaches 0 of x to the fourth of sine or times sine 1 over x. Well, that, that limit is 0. So get this written down. Get it in your notes because I'm going to head off to the chalkboard and work through it. All right, so uh, here we are. We've just seen the squeeze theorem one more time. This theorem is going to be with you throughout all of calculus. Um, this example, we're going to use the squeeze theorem to show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x to the fourth sine 1 over x equals 0. So, I mean, notice direct substitution would fail in trying to find this limit. But you're being told what the limit is. So let's verify it by using the squeeze theorem. So where to start? Well, I'm going to start with the trig function sine. We know for all real theta, we know that sine is always between negative 1 and 1. We know that. Sine of anything is between negative 1 and 1. Well, now I'm just going to do this little step. I'm going to let, I'm going to let theta equal 1 over x, as long as x does not equal 0. And if I let theta equal 1 over x, that just turns this compound inequality into uh, negative 1 is less than or equal to sine 1 over x is less than or equal to 1. And then I'm going to say, well, as long as uh, um, x, x to the fourth is greater than zero, so as long as x to the fourth is greater than zero, and I guess what I'm kind of also saying there is that x does not equal zero. As long as x to the fourth is greater than zero, it's a positive number, I can multiply all three pieces of this compound inequality by x to the fourth. And by saying it's positive, I don't have to worry about flipping any inequality signs. So let's do that. Let's multiply each piece by x to the fourth. And we have negative x to the fourth is less than or equal to x to the fourth sine 1 over x is less than or equal to x to the fourth. You know, look at this compound inequality. We're going to use the power of the squeeze theorem now. I mean, I know, you know, we know the limit as x goes to infinity of negative x to the fourth. We know that limit is zero. Direct substitution tells us the limit is zero. We know that the limit as x goes to zero of x to the fourth is zero. That's thanks to direct substitution. So the power of the squeeze theorem, since we know this limit and we know this limit, we know that the limit of what's trapped in between, the limit as x goes to zero of the function that is trapped between those two functions, we know that limit has to be zero thanks to 
the squeeze theorem. Give you just a little bit of practice here with the squeeze theorem and the power of the squeeze theorem and how to use the squeeze theorem. I would like you in section uh, 2.3, I'd like you to try number 83 part B. So pause the video, do 83 part B, and then restart the video and I'll be here at the chalkboard working through it. Okay, in 83B we were told uh, that this inequality can be shown to be true. And uh, in part B, we were asked to find the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x. I have a compound inequality. I see sine x over x is trapped between two functions. So I'm looking at the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus x squared over 6. And direct substitution tells us that limit is 1. I'm looking at the limit as x goes to 0. Well, of that function, 1, the limit of a constant is that constant. So the limit as x goes to 0 of this piece is 1. The limit as x goes to 0 of that piece is 1. The squeeze theorem says that the limit as x goes to 0 of the function that is trapped between those two has to have the same limit, 1. The squeeze theorem seems so simple, so basic, and it really is, but it's so very powerful, as you will see throughout calculus. Folks, that's it for section 2.3, so at this time you can do all the exercises in 2.3. So, do the practice, do the exercises in 2.3, and thanks for watching.